and just your, your presence has been so awesome this morning, and we just rejoice in that, Father God. Thank you for Shabbat, and just for this beautiful fellowship as your love moves among us, uh, and as the word comes forward, just let there be a, an anointing of wisdom and understanding to bring glory and honor to Yeshua. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. Genesis 41, this week's Torah portion, it begins at verse 1, and it's called Miketz, because it says, now at the end of two whole years, Pharaoh was dreaming. And he has this dream, and, and nobody can interpret it uh, in his court. Now, I'm going to come back to that, but, but you see that this is the story of Joseph. And through just an incredible, amazing twist of events, Joseph, the son of a Hebrew shepherd, rejected by his brothers, thrown into a pit, nearly left for dead, and then sold into slavery uh, with Ishmaelite traders. He becomes the, really the ruler of the greatest empire in the whole world. In, 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 in essence, he was, he was in Pharaoh's place in every way. Pharaoh was just Pharaoh in name only. And it, it, he, Joseph rose so high that Pharaoh just kind of backed away and just said, you know, you do everything. And, you know, people bowed to him. People respected him from all around the civilized world at that time as if he was Pharaoh. And it's incredible because he sunk so low, or I should say he fell so low, he was thrown by his brothers being being rejected he was thrown into slavery and after that uh, he was thrown into prison and after that God raised him up to the highest throne in the highest empire in the highest civilization of the world at that time so it's an incredible reversal and uh, one of the verses in this week's portion from Genesis 41 is here in verse 45 and I want to start with this verse because it says Pharaoh this is Genesis 41 45 Pharaoh named Joseph he, he gave him a name and the name that he gave him was Safnat Paneach and I want to tell you um, I have a son named Joseph and uh, I was actually planning on naming him Tzafnat Paneach, but <laughs> we settled on Joseph. No, that, <laughs> that would be a tough name to be named, but Pharaoh named him Tzafnat Paneach, and that, there was a reason why he gave him that name, because that name means the revealer of secrets or revealer of mysteries. Paneach, which means revealer, uh, and Tzafnat, which means uh, the, the, uh, the mysteries or the secrets. And you see that this name that they gave Joseph is in relation to uh, not only what he was able to do in terms of interpreting Pharaoh's dream, which I'll describe as we move forward in this message, but they, they saw that Joseph had this gift, that Joseph had this ability to discern God's will, not only to interpret dreams, but he... He knew God's will, and he knew, not only knew God's will in terms of making choices, but he seemed to be able to draw forth the blessings of God upon his life and all of those around him. Tzafnat Paneach, the revealer of mysteries. Now, you have to understand this from the Egyptian point of view. The, the Egyptians, they were, they were like a, a very mysterious culture, you know, a... Uh, to this day, you know, people can't figure out a lot of things about the Egyptians. Um, but they were, they were very secretive in terms of their religion. And they had, um, uh, like, sort of like mystery cults, you know, people were initiated into, and, and the, the pyramids are connected to this, and all these secret societies throughout the ages uh, that sort of, they find their roots in that, 
and they in Babylon they had apparently something similar there the the mysteries the secret mystery religion of Babylon and and uh, but Joseph wasn't part of that Joseph was the fulfillment of what they were trying to do through their occult religious practices through their idolatrous and pagan practices that in, in which they were attempting to reveal the secrets of the universe and you know the Egyptians accomplished some amazing things I mean they built the pyramids nobody knows how they did it with the limited technology that they had uh, Pharaoh had these guys in his courts and we see this in Moses time also uh, that were called in the Torah they're called Chochamim which means wise men that could be applied to you know to a good wise man also but uh, they were they were like Pharaoh's magicians and his his occult priests the priests of the mystery cult of Egypt and um, when Moses came and came before Pharaoh he laid his staff down it turned into a serpent and Pharaoh brings in his guys and they turn their staffs into serpents too I don't know how the heck they did it uh, maybe it was just more like a magic trick Moses is there's you know Moses what he did wasn't what he did it was what God did it was God showing the sign of his power and then Moses staff swallowed up the staffs of Pharaoh that's the important thing which was really the sign whatever you got Pharaoh is nothing before the mighty God uh, and then they tried to duplicate a few of the plagues in the beginning you know uh, after I forget the third or fourth plague something like that they ran out and they gave up but uh, again I, I don't know you know if it was they were just sort of like David Copperfield type magic tricks you know this guy made the Statue of Liberty disappear supposedly <laughs> so <laughs> you know if they were you know if, I don't know what it was but they had these guys and so so it was in Joseph's time too so it kind of puts it in perspective because they were fascinated with you know people who knew secrets and mysteries about the universe that was what the Egyptians were known for and along comes this guy Joseph who is the revealer of the mystery of mysteries the secret of secrets the one true God the God of Abraham Isaac and Jacob the God of his grandparents and of his father and there was no tricks there was no occult magic or, or art to it or, at all it was just that he was Safnat Paneach he was the revealer of the infinite God he was the revealer of the creator of the universe he knew the thoughts he knew the will of God and he was able as I said to draw forth as Isaiah said you shall draw forth water from the well of salvation with joy and Joseph was able to do this and they were just they were amazed with him because and it starts with him uh, interpreting this dream, uh, at least in Pharaoh's court. And, and the dream was, in essence, uh, Pharaoh had this dream where he saw these lean cows, seven of them, and seven fat cows as well. And the, the, the lean, sickly cows ate the fat, healthy cows. And then he had, a, and then he ha had another dream where he saw uh, seven good ears of corn, good, healthy ears of corn, and seven thin sickly ears and the thin sickly ears of corn ate up the good ones just like the cows the sick cows ate the healthy cows and and none of the wise men or magicians in Pharaoh's court could figure out what this was and they probably were afraid to even try because you'd be better off to say nothing than to give it a try and be wrong I think so um, Joseph was able to interpret the dream but not only interpret the dream but he was also you know when Pharaoh heard it was presented with this question you know what do I do Joseph was able to discern God's will for how to deal with this because the interpretation was there's gonna be seven years of plenty prosperity and seven followed by seven years of famine and want so what do you do Joseph said first appoint a wise and discerning man <laughs> over Egypt <laughs> hint hint wink wink you know he was using a little Jewish seichel right there which is 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 kind of a kind of practical wisdom you know and uh, but secondly um, during the years of plenty and prosperity take 20 percent of all the grain of Egypt and store it away so that during the seven years not only there'll be enough for Egypt 
but all the nations of the world that are knocked out by this famine, they're going to come to Egypt and they're going to buy from Egypt so that Egypt prospers during that time of famine when people are on the brink of starvation. Egypt is prospering because people are coming to buy grain that's been stored away and they were only able to do it because of this man who was wise and discerning who knew the will of God and was able to draw forth from the the revelation of God to uh, not only be blessed but to be a blessing unto others and so um, Pharaoh was so taken with him uh, he says a couple of things he says in verse 38 Genesis 41 38 Pharaoh said to his servants, Can a man like this be found, one in whom is God's spirit? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has made all this known to you, there is no one as discerning and wise as you. You will be over my house. All my people will pay homage to you. Only in relation to the throne will I be greater than you. Pharaoh set him over his whole house. You know, when he says only in relation to the throne... Will I be greater? It's like saying, I'm greater in name only, but you're basically Pharaoh. And that's really what happened. Joseph was running the greatest empire. And people came and they bowed to him. It says in verse 41, or excuse me, verse 42, that Pharaoh put his signet ring from his hand upon Joseph's hand. This is not only symbolic, but Joseph can use that to seal documents in Pharaoh's name. You know, we see the same thing in the book of Esther with Mordecai. When Haman's plan, don't boo, (laughs) when Haman's plan was revealed, you can't mention the guy's name without a wise guy out there. (laughs) Anyway, um, when that was all revealed, um, Mordecai was dressed in royal robes of blue and white, and he was also the king, King Ahasuerus, put his ring upon Mordecai put him on a, uh, a horse, a white horse, and, uh, you know, he rode through the streets and people hailed him and, and revered him and he could use the king's ring to seal documents and issue letters in the king's name. It's, it's very similar. In, the, in that situation, there was also a, a twist, a reversal, a total reversal of circumstances. And, and uh, this is what happens in Joseph's case. Pharaoh gives him his ring. He sets him up to run the empire, clothed him with fine linens, put a chain of gold around his neck with a big giant chai, just like the, the Jews in Miami. You ever seen those? <laughs> a, a big giant one, I'm sure. No, I'm, I'm making that part up. But he did put uh, jewels and, and um, royal robes on him. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh, yet without your permission, no one will lift up his hand or his foot in the whole land of Egypt. And then Pharaoh named him Zaphonat Paneach, and he gave him Asnat, who was the daughter of the priest of On, a royal, a woman of royal descent to be his wife, and Asnat bore him Ephraim and Manasseh later on. So Joseph went from, you know, being basically in the Pharaoh's dungeon one, in one day to being the highest leader in the highest empire of the whole world with a beautiful woman of royal descent to be his new wife. It's amazing. And it says he was 30 years old. Verse 46, Joseph was 30 years old when all that started. Yeshua was 30 when he started his ministry. There's a connection there, I think. King David was 30 when he began to reign as king, uh, first over um, Judah and Hebron. Joseph's life parallels Yeshua's in so many ways. He suffered for the deliverance of his brothers, of his people, but also not only for them, but first, and you see this in verse 57 of chapter 41, 41, 57, Boy, Herb's doing a great job keeping up with me. Praise God for that. Uh, Yet the whole world came to Egypt to buy grain. See, everybody came. So the whole world, the civilized world, I I assume, was delivered because of 
Joseph, because he suffered, and this is how he ended up there to begin with, he was sent there, he was sold into slavery, he was thrown into Pharaoh's dungeon, he wouldn't have been there in this situation on Pharaoh's throne if he hadn't gone through those things. I'm sure he would say there's got to be a better way for this to come about, but you see how everything worked for good in Joseph's life. Um, but he, he's, his life is a, is a type, it's a, it's a prophetic um, teaching. I hate to say foreshadow. I don't like that word, but you know, it's kind of a, akin to what I'm saying, but a prophetic teaching. I think part of it is that we know Yeshua's Messiah because we read about Joseph. We read about the way that he suffered and all of that was a teaching so that later on would people understand Messiah, Yeshua followed that path. He, Joseph suffered for the deliverance of people from all these nations and also at the end for his own brothers for, first for the nations and then his own brothers come but he's got to forgive his own brothers because they were the ones that put him through all that service all that struggling they were the ones that sold him to foreigners that cast him off as good as dead sell, selling him off to slavery was as good as a death sentence anyway those guys didn't live more than 10 years uh, you know if they were in a good a good place it was a horrible bitter life um and uh their life wasn't worth worth much more than an animal typically and they didn't live very long but uh joseph did forgive them and they were uh forgiven and they were delivered his brothers the brothers of israel and uh of course he wasn't able to bring them into eternal life he wasn't the Mashiach, he wasn't the, the Savior, but he, he was the deliverer in the way that Moses was. Uh, he delivered them physically. He uh, enabled people to, to carry on. And he also uh, lifted them up. He lifted up their understanding. He lifted up their relationship with the Almighty because of who he was. Everything that Joseph did was blessed. Everywhere he went, he prospered. Let's go back a little bit as I follow on that point for a moment here into the end of last week's portion. You see Genesis 39. In Genesis 39, verse 1, this is where Joseph is first sold into slavery. And he ends up, he was brought down to Egypt by the Ishmaelite traders, and this guy Potiphar, Potiphar, whose name really means little Pharaoh, far, like Pharaoh's name is Pharaoh, okay, Potiphar it means like little Pharaoh, and he was a, an officer of Pharaoh, commander of the bodyguards, Potiphar bought him from the hand of the Ishmaelites who had brought him down there, okay, but, and, and, and presumably, by the way, he would have been, you know, he would have been worked just like all the other slaves. It would have been a, a miserable life of suffering. And, uh, but what happened was Adonai was with Joseph. This is Joseph's, this is his, his secret. This is, this is what makes Joseph who he is. Is that, now that's true for you and me too. It's not really a mystery but it is because, you know, the world doesn't see what we see if we are children of God. The, the invisible God, who is a mystery to the rest of the world, is revealed to the disciples of Yeshua. And so Joseph had that revelation. And because the Lord was with him, it says that he became a successful man. In the house of his master, the Egyptian, uh, he prospered. His master saw that the Lord was with him. His master saw this, and in, in, in the Hebrew it says, "Adonai ito." Ito means was with him. Adonai ito with him. That that's what made Joseph the man of God that he was. Adonai ito, the Lord was with him. Potiphar saw that. The Lord made everything he set his hand to successful. Everything Joseph did 
prospered. It was successful. Everything that he did, even being a slave in Potiphar's house, I don't know what kind of uh, chores that he might have had him doing or, or jobs he might have had him do, but Potiphar saw right off there was something about this guy. And not only did Joseph prosper, but everything around him prospered. It says Joseph found favor in his eyes. So he served him as a personal servant. Potiphar made him an overseer over his household. Everything that was his, he entrusted into his hand. It's the same thing Pharaoh did, isn't it? Little Pharaoh. You see, it, it's, the paradigm is already being set. And, and so, you know, you see this in the life of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob also, that they seem to have this thing where even though they're strangers in a strange land, and I've been talking about this in the previous weeks because we've been going portion to portion through the book of Genesis, how all of the patriarchs were gerim. They were sojourners, strangers. They didn't own any land. They were surrounded by foreign people, constantly in peril, and yet God just seemed to just raise them up and raise them up. Each one of them became like mighty kings in the eyes of the Canaanites and the Hittites. They prospered. They had silver, gold, herds, camels, servants, tons of people with them. And, but it was against all odds. It was, it was against all possibilities. But what does the Bible say? With God, all things are possible. It's true. And see, they walked with God. But what's different about Joseph is that not only was he finding himself in extremely impossible circumstances, just like his father's. But add to that, he was persecuted. So he, it wasn't just like he was in a place where there's no way that you can prosper. But just like, you know, his, his fathers were. But add to that, that he was persecuted on top of it. He was rejected by his brothers. He was thrown into slavery. He was then thrown into prison. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't go through that. They had hard circumstances, but they didn't have the persecution on top of this. Now, all of this is prophetic concerning the nation that is to come forth from Abraham's family and from Joseph. Because the Jewish people through the generations have had all of this. Impossible circumstances, being strangers. The whole history of the Jews in Europe is a great example of that. We're strangers traveling through a strange land. We can't own anything. Uh, we can't live in the cities. We can't participate in the economy. But, but somehow Jewish people always found a way. They always found a way to congregate together, to, to maybe make treaties with the, the ruling authorities, get, get a, little, a little foothold into the economy maybe. And, you, and, and you'll see this, that in the history of the Jews, Wherever the Jews were given a lot of freedom, America is a great example of that. Wherever the Jews were given a lot of freedom, as a, as a people, they did they did very well. They prospered, and they did not only for themselves, but they contributed great things to their society. And boy, you see that going on now. Uh, if I was to tell you all the Nobel Peace Prizes that have been won in the last hundred years by Jewish people, you'd probably already heard it uh, because, <laughs> you know, most people who are in the Messianic movement have heard that a number of times. And it's an amazing figure because it's such a small percentage of the world population. And, and so, as I said, as I keep saying, Joseph not only succeeded and prospered in his own behalf, but he blessed everyone around him. He not only discerned God's will for himself, but for everyone around him and so this is the path of the Jews but also the Jews like Joseph overcame incredible persecution in these strange lands especially Europe where uh, the people of Israel wandered incredible persecution the Crusades the the I think the Inquisition other than the Holocaust the Inquisition was a horrible time when Jews in Spain which were very much like Jews in America very prosperous, a lot of government officials, part of high society, tons of doctors, entertainers, lawyers, um, businessmen of all kinds, real estate owners. Spain 
uh, was very much like America. And then one day, 1492, you got to leave. <laughs> you can't be part of the Spanish Empire anymore. Many of the people who came to the New World to Spanish America were actually Jews that were fleeing the Inquisition. It's, uh, it's hard to, um, in, you know, 500 years later to know who's who. But that's why many of the, the uh, Hispanic names that end in EZ are also originally Sephardic Jewish names. There's a little bit of history for you. But anyway, um, you see that, that there's a parallel there. Uh, and, and prophetically, what's happening in Joseph's life is, is similar to what the people Israel would experience later on. But it's most similar to Yeshua. Yeshua himself was, was uh, rejected by his own people. He suffered. He rose from the dead. He became the savior of the whole world, a blessing for all mankind, but also for his own brothers. That's the last part, and Yeshua is coming back. Here's a mystery right here. Paul called it so in Romans 11. He said, be not ignorant of this mystery, that blindness in part has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and so shall all Israel be what? Saved. So shall all Israel be saved. It's a mystery. He said, be not ignorant of this mystery. This, this mystery is the crux of the whole thing. The gospel is going forth to all the nations, all the Gentiles, until that fullness has been reached, the fullness of that time. Then all Israel will start to be saved. And when that portion is saved, that, that's when Yeshua is coming back. We will look upon him and mourn for him, the one who we have pierced. His own people in Jerusalem will, will receive him back and an innumerable, an innumerable host from all the nations of the world. I shall be one of them. <laughs> How about you? Praise God. I look forward to that. But, you know, um, Joseph, as I was saying, um, even in Potiphar's house, Potiphar made him the head of the household and the lord blessed it says it again in verse five do we still have that up there yeah adonai blessed the egyptian's house because of joseph potiphar realized i'm getting blessed because of joseph some of the some of the nations in europe understood this it went up and down up and down we're getting blessed because of the Jews, or we could be blessed if we bless the Jews. Do you think America understands we could be blessed if we bless Israel? It's true. It's just, it's a law. It's like if I throw this cup up in the air, it's going to come splat down. You can't argue with gravity. Uh, you know, and so there's a blessing upon Israel. I believe it's for Messiah's sake because Yeshua came from Israel. There's a blessing upon Israel. The nations that bless Israel will be blessed. It's true. So um, we see this in Joseph's life. Everything around him, Potiphar was, was blessed. He was loving it. He released everything he owned to Joseph's hand. With him in charge, he didn't think about anything except the food he ate. Potiphar's wife was uh, kind of a, a psycho, I guess, and she um, desired Joseph. He wouldn't have anything to do with her. And she got so angry with him, you know, how dare you reject me kind of thing. And so she made up a lie that he tried to throw himself on her. Because of that, I think Potiphar knew that it was, it was bull-oney. But the problem is, and I say that because otherwise Joseph would have been put to death. Come on. Um, but um, rather than have him executed, he put him in to Pharaoh's prison, which was probably a prison for like political prisoners and that sort of thing. So Joseph was was thrown into prison, and we see in uh, Genesis 39, 21, look what happens there. Genesis 39, 21, Adonai was with Joseph and extended kindness to him. Again, there it is. The Lord was with him. Adonai Itol. The Lord was with Joseph, even in prison extended kindness to him, gave him favor in the eyes of the commander of the prison. Now look what happens. 
commander of the prison, entrusted to Joseph's hand all the prisoners who were in the prison so that everything that was done there, he was responsible for it. There it is again. Even the prison was put under Joseph's command because everybody saw that God was with him. The commander of the prison did not concern himself with anything at all under his care because Adonai was with him, and Adonai made whatever he did successful. Everything he did prospered, and people saw it. And so this uh, fact about Joseph, it is not... It doesn't have to be just peculiar to Joseph. What made Joseph who he was is, is available to each one of us as followers of Yeshua. It could be said of you, Adonai Ito, the Lord is with him or her. And this is um, available to each and every one of us. This is what made him Safanad Paneach, the hidden God who created the universe. It's not hidden, in, hidden anymore when the Lord is with you. Now, um, I want to um, wrap up this message, and I like, to, um, I like to do it in this way. And this is from Matthew 19, 26. I want to tell you that I'm asked, as a Messianic rabbi, I'm asked a certain question. All the time, I'm asked this question. And there are certain questions I think every Messianic rabbi is asked. This is one of those. Um, and the question is this. People ask all the time, why do Jewish people always seem to prosper? And, you know, it's, it's such a generalization. It's such a stereotype. It's not always true. I can tell you that. But in the whole, it's true. If you look at the, the people as a people, okay, especially in America in this generation. Now, now you know, some Jews would get offended by that, but not, not many. Um, I mean, if you look at... Um, the uh, the way that Jewish people in America it, in let's just talk about the um, now there are different kinds of prosperity there's different kinds of success okay uh, but let's just look at the material the financial world you know Jewish people in America have done very well I mean am I true it, it's true I mean it's obvious it's a, it's glaringly true I mean r the real estate moguls the the bankers the Wall Street guys it's not necessarily to say their life is in order or that they're happy. I'm, I'm just saying there's definitely something there. There's something going on there. This is not a coincidence. The, the, uh, the government right now, there's a lot of Jews in the, in the White House, government officials, the entertainment business, the news media. It's unbelievable how many Jewish people are in that. Right, Daniel? <laughs> Daniel just did a, a little stint in Hollywood. He could tell you. Um, anytime you watch a movie, watch the credits at the end of the movie. Goldberg, Rosenthal, <laughs> Silverstein, you know, Spielberg. <laughs> Never the actors, though. <laughs> it's always the producers. Anyway, there's, there's something there. And as I said, it, it seems to happen in times of when there's a lot of freedom because if you look at times where there was a lot of oppression look at poland in the 19 late 30s and and uh, from 1939 to 1945 there were 3.25 million jews after the war there was maybe a few thousand left half of the six million came from poland so there was no freedom you see but they, they were doing well up until that time. Anyway, the point is that there's something to it. And I'm always asked, you know, what is it? You know, is there some, something that, you know, Jews have figured out, you know, that they're hiding from the rest of the world or something like that? And I, 
I, I would explain it this way. I think there are two explanations. And we see it in the life of Joseph. That's why I'm talking about this. Okay, We see it in the life of Joseph. Two explanations. One, there's a blessing upon the Jewish nation. There's a blessing upon Israel. It's totally scriptural. I will bless those who bless you. And that blessing is for the sake of the Messiah. It's really for Yeshua's sake that Israel has been blessed so that he could come forth and be the Savior of the world so that he can return and sit upon the throne of Israel and of David. So there's a blessing upon Israel. Uh, but it's not just that. There, there's, a, there's a certain wisdom. This is the second thing. There's a certain wisdom that you would find among the Jewish people and the Jewish nation, and you see it glaringly in Israel today. And the best way I could describe this is that it's, it's an understanding that opportunities are created, not acquired. <clears throat> opportunities are created, not acquired. And now, there's an old saying that, uh, what's that saying? That necessity is the mother of invention. You ever heard that? You know, when, when your back's up against the wall, you, you come up with ways to advance. And so this is what's happened to the people of Israel historically. And, uh, it, and it's been an example to the whole world. You know, when, you're, when you're, half your people are dead in the Holocaust and you realize the whole world practically has conspired against you or has just basically just not cared that people are being rounded up, babes in arms and old ladies together and thrown into gas chambers and murdered systematically. When you look at that and go, okay, we've got to come up with something. And it was out of that experience that the state of Israel came forth. You see? And, and so in, in economic terms, you know, in, in, in economics, they, they use the term goods. You know, goods, it can, uh, goods and services, that's right. And it can mean, it can mean money, but it, not necessarily, you know. Goods are goods. And there's this understanding among the Jews that goods are not already there, but they're created. Do you see the difference? And I'm sharing this with you. Now, now for Jews, it, it has to be this way because Jews, the experience of the Jewish people is as a people. Like I said, there's not, it's not everybody, but as, as a people, as a nation, um, you know, it's a people just like the patriarchs, sojourners, wanderers, gerim in the earth, own nothing, have no place to lay their head. Um, but given the opportunity, uh, Jewish people have found ways to create wealth, to create goods. Okay, uh, we, we don't have any oil. The state of Israel doesn't have any oil. It's amazing because all around the state of Israel, there's oil. The hugest oil deposits on the earth are all around, but the, the Arab countries are so backward. Even though they've got all the wealth with the oil, they can't get it together. They're crazy. They want to live in the 12th century. They want to live in oppression. They want to live in, in, in fear. And, and their religion teaches them things that are absurd. And so, unfortunately for those countries, even though they have these huge natural resources, they can't get it together. They can't advance. They can't prosper. There's no peace. There's no joy in those lands. It's, it's nothing but horror and misery. But look at all that they have. Meanwhile, in Israel, they don't have hardly any natural resources. They didn't even have soil that could bring forth food. They had to bring water in and irrigate. They had to drain the swamps to get the mosquitoes out in the Hula Valley and these kinds of things. They didn't have tanks. They invented tanks. The best tanks, the best machine guns in the world are coming out of Israel. The best example of that today is the tech startup industry. Uh, the tech startup industry in Israel is a model for the whole capitalist world. They're inventing uh, new things every day 
in Israel, from Haifa to Tel Aviv. There's just tons and tons of tech startup companies inventing new technology. Most of it is for the good of humanity. Most of it is in the field of medicine, and they're inventing things. If anybody's going to eradicate cancer before the Messiah comes back, I would put my money on the Jewish state. I mean, they're, they're very likely to come up with a, a cure for it. I hope they do. I hope they do soon. But, you know, um, the idea is that wealth is created. Goods are created. Now, the opposite of that is that there's a finite amount of things on the earth, so whoever's strong enough to go out and control it all wins. And that's the way that the nations have operated historically. And why am I saying all this? Because... You know, especially if you're a Messianic Jew or you're a Messianic Gentile, look what we have compared to the church world. We have nothing, but we have everything. <laughs> we're the Tzafanad Paneachs. At least we're called to be. And I know I'm generalizing too, but we're, that's the calling, you see? And and within the people of Israel, it's the Messianic that are the Josephs. We're the ones that are rejected and persecuted, even by our own people. But the church world doesn't accept us either. We, we try to be accepted by the church world. We do. But they don't. I'm just telling you. I know some of you are people who go to church also. You know, uh, so, uh, but you're here. That's, you're not the church world because you're here on Shabbat. But the church world proper... I'm talking about, you know, the, the, uh, the bread and butter church world that don't come to Shabbat services in Messianic synagogue. Not the individuals, but the institutions. They don't accept us. I don't think they ever will. I hope they do, and I hope that they learn if they lift us up and bless us that they'll be blessed because we're not here to take from them. We're here to create. We're here to bring forth as Tzaphanat Paneach, to discern the will of God, to bring forth, just like the state of Israel is doing, so that all of Israel can be saved. And uh, I'm sorry to the church world that many Gentile believers are coming into this. I'm sorry. But can we get a little, a little credit here? Throw us a bone here. We started this. We brought it to you to begin with. That's my message, okay? And this really is on my heart right now. Because, because there's this dichotomy right now because there's, we're still celebrating Hanukkah and then there's Christmas. I'm not, I'm not bad-mouthing people that keep Christmas. I never do. But, but I will bad-mouth the, the roots of that festival. I mean, why can't pastors admit that Christmas came from pagan roots? Why can't pastors admit that? It, it's, we're not saying don't keep it. We, you know, we keep Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving's not in the Bible either. We go to football and basketball games. That's not in the Bible. Everything doesn't have to come from the Bible. You can make it meaningful by making it about the Lord. Make it about the Lord, not Santa and all this other stuff. Make it about the Lord. Fine, but just know this. He, Yeshua was not born December 25th. I'm sorry. It, at least it doesn't say that he was. Do I know what day was he was born? I think so. But I'm not 100% sure, so I'm not going to make a doctrine. I'm not going to make that a holiday out of that. We're just going to call it Sukkot. And then when he comes back and the whole world keeps Sukkot, we'll ask him, were you born on Sukkot? Do you want us to do anything about it? Maybe not. Maybe, you know, may, how about, you know, but we do celebrate. Maybe we don't celebrate his birth, but we celebrate his death and his resurrection at Passover, you see. But there's nothing wrong with celebrating Christmas. I don't think there is. Some of you probably think that there is something wrong. I don't think there's anything wrong. I think it's a beautiful holiday. It's not part of my tradition. I don't, you know, well, it is movies and Chinese food. <laughs> Try it. Try it this year if you've never done it. Huh? That's the only restaurants that will be open in Thomasville, I guarantee it, is the Chinese restaurants. That's how that started. And the movies are always open. But, but if, you, if you gather with family, if you know people that gather with family and they have a tree and they get together and have eggnog and, 
and celebrate and worship the Lord and all. That's good. There's nothing wrong with that. That's not, see, that's not where I'm coming from. I don't see anything wrong with that, but you have to be honest about it. He wasn't really born that day. Why believe a lie? And do you know that, that we sometimes who are in this are hated because we say things like that? Sorry, but not really. Of Joseph it was said, <laughs> Adonai Ito, the Lord was with him. That's all I hope that anyone will say about me. How about you? Adonai Itcha, is the Lord with you? Adonai Itcha? Hopefully the answer to that is yes. Thank you, Father, for the fact that we're able to be with you and that you're with us and through Messiah Yeshua, our Lord, who has taken away our sins and given us the Ruach HaKodesh. We praise you and honor you in his name. Amen. Baruch Hashem. I enjoyed sharing that message and, and uh, praise God. Thank you for uh, agreeing with me. And we're going to um, close the service in a moment. So if you would, please stand, and don't forget we've got a, uh, a nice challah and some wine over here for the closing blessings. Tonight is the seventh night of Hanukkah, and then tomorrow's the last one. Yivarech Adonai, v'yishmorecha. Yair Adonai panavilecha v'chunecha. Yisa Adonai panavilecha v'yasem lecha. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. May the Lord Lift up his countenance upon you and bring you his peace in Yeshua's name. Shabbat Shalom.